and welcome to this week's episode of Did Shakespeare. My name is Cassidy Cash. How would you like to experience the history of William Shakespeare? The same history that you learn about in these episodes with me every Saturday? Well, now you can. We have just launched our Experience Shakespeare Digital History Kits, and they let you dive into the history of William Shakespeare and try out a piece of his history for yourself. Each kit coordinates with the history episodes we do here and podcast episodes so you can hear from Shakespeare experts the exact history that you're trying out for yourself. These kits include a complete history guide along with video tutorials, step-by-step -step instructions, and a full supply list that let you try out our complete series of card games, recipes, dances, and other activities so you can cook, play, and dance your way through the life of William Shakespeare. Think of them like science labs for history class. Find out more and sign up to have a complete kit sent to you every month at castycash.com slash experience. That's castycash.com slash experience. Mailbox weren't officially invented until the 1850s, so the short answer this week is no, William Shakespeare didn't have a mailbox. But of course, the history doesn't stop there. There are letters talked about in Romeo and Juliet. In fact, a defunct postal service is one of the reasons we end up with the tragedy that is Romeo and Juliet. So according to the research of one Shakespeare scholar named Catherine Elizabeth Moroni, there are no less than 180 letters used across the works of William Shakespeare, and more than 90 of them actually show up with characters holding them on stage as physical items. So why were people in the 16th century writing letters, and they were delivering letters, before the establishment of the Postal Service? And if they didn't have mailboxes, how were the letters getting and being delivered from place to place? That's the history we're going to explore this week when we ask, did Shakespeare have a mailbox? <laughs> that in the 16th century and the life of William Shakespeare, being able to write was not a universal skill. In fact, there was a large portion of the society that couldn't read or write at all. In addition to many people not knowing how to write or to write their thoughts on paper, actually acquiring paper was also pretty difficult in the 16th century, so not everybody did this intentionally nor regularly. Nevertheless, Letter writing did occur, and the practice of writing letters was actually finding its feet during the life of William Shakespeare, like so many other things. The 16th century was the point in history when we see people starting to intentionally pick up letter writing as a form of communication. Now, this did happen at all class levels in society, but it was particularly popular with the middle classes and higher. Letter writing initially began in history as a type of art form. It was thought to go along with literature, oral composition, and the composition of epistles. You might think of Paul the Apostle and his famous epistles. These were put right alongside writers like Homer and Horace and Seneca, who were also writing these long form letters that communicated an idea, but they were constructed to be an art form, like a painter might express their thoughts or ideas in a picture, these artists express their thoughts and ideas through words, and particularly long words. Cicero is given credit for being the first letter-writing artist, with other famous writers like Horace, Seneca, Pliny the Younger, and others following suit. Even many pastors and religious leaders would write epistles in this art form, and it was considered artwork. Ovid, who is a well-known influencer of Shakespeare and source material for many of Shakespeare's plays, turned the elegy into a letter. These models of the letter of art served as models for Renaissance artists like Shakespeare, who would use the letter in their work, both as he was writing and the sonnets and actual letters that Shakespeare wrote, as well as a dramatic device in some of his plays. We find letter writing influencing many writers of the 16th century, and many of them contemporary to Shakespeare. One example is from the playwright John Lyly, who is credited with creating the euphemism. It's thought that he got this idea from copying work by a famous Spanish letter artist named Guevara. Catherine Moroni quotes in her dissertation that, quote, the works of Guevara turned into English by five or six different translators had a considerable vogue and acclimatized this extraordinary style in Great Britain. One of his writings, especially the Golden Book of Martius Aurelius, Emperor, enjoyed a very great popularity. It was translated by Lord Berniers in 1532 and Sir Thomas North in 1557 and went through many editions. These many editions suggest that it was highly popular. From the life of William Shakespeare, we have historical archival 
information known as primary sources. These are the physical papers that actually date to within the life of William Shakespeare. One of those that relates to letters is called the Past and Letters. This was a series of correspondence between an aristocratic family in England that survived from the life of William Shakespeare. By themselves, they demonstrate that the upper class and well-educated were routinely and on purpose communicating through letters and writing them as a matter of course. There were even a form of newspaper circulating in England using letters. Now, this was in the 16th century, and there was a collection of letters known as the Fuggers. This was an actual place where you could mail in your account of what had occurred. Now, most of these, when you look through them, it's a lot of gossipy things where people are talking about their neighbors and whatever, but they counted as first-hand witness accounts of events, and they would write them down and mail them in, and these had been collected into what is essentially a historical account of events during these years. These were considered professional letters, and it was a precursor to things like the press or television or even radio bulletins that we might have today. You can actually see an overarching theme of letters being used to inform people of current events actually within one of the famous Shakespeare history primary documents called Brutesworth of Wit. Now, this was written by Robert Greene, and in it, it's famous because he insults William Shakespeare. But part of this letter also says that he wrote it specifically to, quote, inform his fellow scholars about this city. Letter writing enjoyed a great popularity and even a status symbol. The Middle Ages saw a system of standard standardization that would go on to teach people by letter. By the 16th century, this took the form of compiling letters into teaching curriculum. This looked like handbooks or manuals, and you see this in the surviving documents today. There's handbooks on how to plant a garden or how to grow herbs and how to fight with a rapier and dagger. All of these handbooks from the 16th and 17th century were how people compiled information to communicate how to do things. And they were a form of teaching because if the school wasn't available or the school didn't teach these things, people would self-teach themselves by going and getting the handbook or the guide and just learning for themselves what they needed to know to produce this life skill. There were even courses that people could take specifically to teach the art of correspondence as an art form. That particular trend persisted throughout the 20th century all over the world and sadly has sort of diminished in the 21st century, but you see it in other forms like how to type or how to compose an email. So the idea of communicating through words still carries that reputation of being an art form. Now, with all of this focus on the writing of letters, it seems that the actual delivery of the letters took something of a hit during this time period. They weren't all that organized or cohesive about how to get the letters from one place to another. It shouldn't come as any surprise, though, that with all of the focus on letters, the very first law trying to handle what to do with these letters once they have been written comes from the English Parliament in 1591, just a few years before poor Friar Lawrence is given the credit for losing the unfortunate Romeo's letter when he's trying to deliver it to Juliet. Friar Lawrence was not the only poor soul struggling to deliver their messages, though, poetic or not, it was indeed a struggle for the whole of Europe during the, this time. Starting in the Middle Ages, right up into the life of William Shakespeare and continuing thereafter, the struggle wasn't for a lack of trying to have a postal system. It seems that during the Middle Ages in particular, commerce shot up significantly and businessmen drove the need for a way to send messages between corporations and guilds, and so they established a messenger system. Now, this was prior to things like the Pony Express that we have here in the U.S. by several centuries, but it's the same idea. It's the idea of handing the letter to a person who then carries it to where it's supposed to go. That's the form of delivering a message that happens in Romeo and Juliet, as Friar Lawrence gives it to one of his helpful helpers and has him carry it away, and that man gets delayed by plague and is unable to deliver his message. He gets quarantined. Sorry if that's a spoiler for anyone. But that courier method of delivering a message from one place to another is what was going on during William Shakespeare's lifetime as the official postal service of the age. These carriers would take a message from one place to another following what was known as postal routes. Now, they weren't necessarily called postal routes, but they did have identified roads that they were supposed to take. Later in the 17th century, these roads would come to be known post roads. By the 15th century, sending a letter by courier at what can be considered a significant expense was empowered by the Gutenberg printing press. The, the printing press came about in 1450, and now letter carrying became a profitable business as more people had things to deliver. Many private individuals sought to cash in on this particular business form. Some, like the Parr family in Austria, developed a postal system that would function for the whole country of Austria. 
it was quite extensive. And the Thurn and Taxis family are famous for their coastal system, which was also very intricate and involved, organizing the shipment of imperial possessions along with a complicated network of established routes throughout Europe. By William Shakespeare's lifetime, the Thurn and Taxis system covered most of Europe and accounted for approximately 20,000 couriers that were responsible for taking letters where they needed to go. Their system was speedy, efficient, and highly lucrative for the family, which is decidedly not the impression you get about the postal service in general when you read Romeo and Juliet. It seems this discrepancy can be credited to the fact that in England, while Henry VIII did establish a master of posts in 1516 to oversee regular postal delivery service along the main roads that shoot out from London to the rest of the country, this was not intended for public use. Now, just because it wasn't intended for public use doesn't mean that private individuals didn't use it, but it was designed for the royals only. And that means if you weren't a royal sending letters along these official routes, then you were doing so under the table and likely illegally. That did happen, but as you can imagine, the result was often that, like the letter of Romeo's, it didn't exactly get where it was intended to go most of the time. It would not be until close to 20 years after Shakespeare died in 1635 that a royal proclamation established a letter office for England and Scotland, with one Thomas Witherings heading up a system of the regular day and night services along these post roads. And later still, in about 1680, William Dockra established the penny post, where you could mail all letters and packets up to a pound for just a penny. But being talented at correspondence was a well-practiced art form as well as functional communication tool for news among the nation and across multiple classes of individuals. Despite the focus on letter writing and communicating by letter, the actually delivering the letter was a gamble at best. And it would be well after Shakespeare that the nation developed a reliable system with mailboxes that came much later. That's it for this week. I'm Cassidy Cash, and I hope you learned something new about the Bard. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. If you would like to experience Shakespeare with one of our digital history activity kits, don't forget that they are available now on the website. You can become a member and support the show we do here and our podcast, That Shakespeare Life, by becoming a member. And for joining us inside the membership area, you can have a complete digital activity kit sent to you every month. If you're an educator or a homeschool family that would like to build a course around these kits and our entire resource library full of maps, guides, and printables that you can use to teach this at home or in your classroom, you might want to look at our annual subscription. The annual subscription is $200 a year, and it includes all 12 of the Groundling Level kits. That's the same as getting two free kits in the monthly subscription. And I also have put together a 35-week syllabus that outlines for you exactly what to teach and when if you want to use our activities, videos, and printables for an entire course. The course will give you dual credit, one in literature and one in history, for one academic year. If you're interested in that, find out more at castycast.com slash experience. castycast.com slash experience. And feel free to email me if you have any questions. I'll be happy to talk with you. That's it. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.